everybody. Welcome to the Overdrive Digital Show. We waited just as long as many of you have probably waited to test ride Ola's electric scooter, and still the test ride time frame was too short for us to minutely evaluate every aspect of the scooter. Nevertheless, Chris shares his honest opinion on Ola's first electric offering. In a short while from now, in fact, he's going to join us as well uh, to give us his uh, opinion on the scooter. So if you have any of the questions, do feel free to jot them down in the comment section. We'll get back shortly with all the answers. Take a look at this story. Now, it's been a long time coming. We've been waiting to get our hands on the scooter. And now we're already well versed with what the specifications of these scooters are, the S1 and the S1 Pro. And we also know of the many features that it comes packed with. And now we finally gotten our hands on it to tell you what riding it is all about. Now what really stands out about the S1 Pro scooter are uh, its big broad seat and that big 7 inch TFT touchscreen display. Uh, they physically look a lot larger than anything we've seen currently on any scooter out here in India. The single sided telescopic front suspension gives you a lot of front alloy to look at which is unique and appealing. The scooter's bodywork also consists of just 5 colour panels that are smooth and curvaceous and with that cute headlight looks very lively, youthful and fun overall. However, we did notice a couple of panel gaps in some of the scooters and even the rubber foot mats didn't fit flush on some of the scooters. So that did look a bit off. The seat is very comfortable and it's broad, tapered towards the front and is very comfortable for the pillion and rider as well. Now, uh, the unseat storage is pretty decent as well. Uh, 36 litres of storage and uh, it's rather flat to be honest so a full face helmet is never going to fit in there uh, but there is a decent amount of space for your half face helmet. The S1 Pro is powered by an electric motor that produces 8.5 kilowatts of peak power and 5.8 nm of torque at the motor shaft. Now this is the same motor that features in the lower S1 variant as well, just that this Pro model gets the bigger 3.97 kWh battery over the regular S1's 2.89 kWh unit. The Pro also gets three riding modes that basically alter the way this Ola scooter accelerates, which are Normal, Sport and Hyper. In Normal mode, the S1 Pro scooter is very conservative in its power delivery. In Sport, the S1 Pro comes alive and it's here where you'll experience a livelier throttle response and just basically a willingness to overtake. Hyper mode is for when you really want to have some fun on the run. Here you'll see the numbers on the digital dash climb very rapidly. Now Ola claims that the Pro can accelerate from 0 to 40 kmph in just 3 seconds and it feels more than capable of managing the sprint time. As far as braking is concerned, I really like the brakes and tyre setup of the S1 Pro. The 12 inch alloy wheels come clad with chunky 110 by 70 section MRF zapper tyres which provide a good amount of grip. The bite from the disc brakes is nice and strong but the brakes can lock up if you're not too careful. Now the seat is at a very accessible height for somebody who's as tall as me at 5'9 and even vertically challenged riders won't find this to be a problem. The turning radius of the scooter is good and even if you're stuck in a tight spot while parking, the reverse mode would definitely help you out there. The S1 Pro feels very light on its feet and most importantly is very rider friendly. The Ola Electric features a tubular chassis which allows it to exude commendable road manners as well as have sharp and almost effortless handling characteristics. It isn't shy of being chucked into corners at high speed as well. Now our stint with the S1 Pro this time around has been very short and we only had time to check out some of its basic functional features via the touch screen like the underseat storage release and some other basic settings. But we didn't really get to check out the more important range and charging capabilities of the S1 Pro. And you'll have to wait till we actually get our hands on the scooter for a longer period of time to really find out and tell you what that is all about. However, this time around we didn't get to experience the scooter regenerative properties. Now the S1 Pro comes with a force regeneration system which basically serves as a way of keeping the battery charging by converting kinetic energy into electrical energy and 
you can basically charge your battery on the go by force shutting your throttle. Summarize it all, the scooter, the S1 Pro is a really nice scooter to ride. Yes, there are a couple of issues, but the problem is why you're paying this premium an amount over for the scooter is the fact that technology doesn't come cheap and there's a lot of tech that's gone into this particular scooter. There are a couple of issues that the company has to sort out and hopefully it will do so before you get your hands on it. All right, guys, we'll just get Chris on the show to answer a couple of your questions. Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Thanks show. Hey, thanks. Good to be here. Chris, uh, firstly, I would like to ask you that do you think, uh, you know, it is worth putting your money on the Ola scooter right now as it is? Uh, well, as of now, let's see. Uh, so, any, so basically, uh, they ha the, the product seems quite sound as it is mechanically, but then there are a couple of issues which the company has to sort out uh, in terms of software uh, management. Uh, so, yes, right now, as it stands, the company have promised that by the time the scooters actually roll out and reach their customers, these issues which we faced when we had our ride off the scooter, they will be sorted out. So, uh, if that is to be considered, yes, it seems very viable. It, it seems like a good proposition because uh, once again, the USP of the scooter is uh, it's very heavy on tech. There's a lot of tech that's gone into it. And um, yes, it, technology doesn't come cheap. So that's basically what you're going to be paying a premium price over uh, the competition uh, in terms of TVS, Aether, Bajaj. Um, yeah, so it does seem like a valuable proposition, provided that these guys actually sort out their stuff before uh, customers actually get their hands on them, the scooters. Okay. And, uh, okay. So I'll just quickly get to, uh, you know, some of the comments and the questions. Jayan Pandit yeah. says it's too expensive. Like you said, tech doesn't come cheap. So right. that's um, one of the observations. Yep. So, uh, basically, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, if you just go through the spec sheet, not only the spec sheet, the, the, the amount of features that, that, um, that are accessible through that seven, that huge, uh, high resolution TFT touchscreen. So uh, there's a lot that the company has put into the scooter and in terms of tech alone. And that seems very exciting and is uh, not currently offered by any other manufacturer in this particular space. So uh, yes, it, it seems justifiable. Uh, the cost does seem justifiable because mechanically it's very sound. Uh, the battery, the suspension, uh, the motor, Everything is on par, but just that software issue, uh, yes, it has to be ironed out ASAP. That's it goes without saying. And um, yeah, basically, it it justifies its cost. Once these guys In fact, uh, that's manage, exactly yes. Yeah, actually, that's exactly what everybody seems to be saying. Apoor has also said the same thing. He says, seems like there's a lot of rough edges that Ola still needs to take care of before delivering the product to customers. Of course, of what's course, up with that? Course. Chris has just been answering that. Yeah, so uh, pretty much so it's the first uh, first generation product. So there are obviously going to be issues that the companies have to uh, iron out gradually over the course of time. So um, every every vehicle for that matter, the, the first one, all the first uh, generation of uh, vehicles always comes with a couple of bugs or glitches or some uh, some uh, shortage. It, it, it always seems to fall short uh, in some form or manner. And uh, right now, as we uh, as of this point in time, it's just the software issues that have really um, it doesn't feel up to the uh, up to the mark at this point in time. But uh, the company have promised us that um, it is going to sort it out by the time people are actually going to have their test rides, which is uh, which has already commenced in around uh, four cities as of this point in time. It's uh, I think it's uh, uh, as of now it's Ahmedabad, Delhi. Uh, Kolkata and Bengaluru. And by, by this weekend, I think the company is going to have a test rides in a couple of other cities as well, including Pune and um, yes, Gujarat and some other cities as well. So some other cities in Gujarat. So Okay. Uh, Ravi Shankar is asking, how do you feel the Ola stands against, say, the uh, Chetak, the TVS iCube and the Aether? Okay, so um, all these scooters come with their own USPs once again. So uh, the Aether is known for, it's, it's pretty much set the benchmark at this point in time. Uh, as far as performance goes, uh, comf it's, it's a comfy scooter, but it can really move. It, it can really go. So uh, it's considered to be one of the most 
uh, app scooters if performance is your thing. And also, uh, it seems like a very sturdy product in terms of its uh, background and uh, what it has to offer, what it comes with uh, technologically, and um, in terms of its underpinnings and all. It's a very solid product. Now, um, TVS, on the other hand, it's a, it's its build quality is really good. It has a lot of things going for it. But on the performance front, it's not so much. It's it's not as uh, performance focused, you could say, as the Aether and even the Ola. Um, now, uh, with the Ola, uh, with the launch of the Ola, it has a lot of performance aspects that are commendable. It's got it's it, it's it's got a good battery and uh, a sizable battery and uh, the motor. So uh, range is one thing that we really have to check out. Once again, and we didn't get to really check it out because our stint with the scooter was really tight and we had a short amount of time to really uh, get a hand or get a grip, get to grip with the scooter. So we didn't really get to check out uh, the charging and the range, which is the most important things that you would want to consider when you buy an electric. So uh, we'll have to wait on. I'll have to really hold on to that kind of uh, comment to really justify what's if it's better actually than the Aether or uh, say a TVS or a Bajaj. I think that's something that most of us are looking forward to. It'll be a very interesting story when we do manage to do that. Um, of course, because that's the main thing. That's what you exactly. intentionally buy an electric scooter for. It's, it's, it's like, okay, fine. Whether you're conscious about the ecosystem or what, it's going to, at the end of the day, it's going to save you money and your running costs and everything. So uh, you're going to look forward to the range and uh, of course with battery anxiety and everything so uh, how it runs in the city how it runs out on the highway if you were to muster yeah. the courage to actually venture out on your scooter that far or if you uh, yeah so basically yeah the battery life and everything that, that we didn't really get a good feel of that this time around we we'll just have to wait till we get our hands on the scooter for a longer stint so uh, to get a hand I, get a hang of that. I don't know whether other people will be brave enough uh, to want to venture out on the highways right now with an electric scooter. But given uh, that you guys have already seen what Bot has done uh, with the e-tron going to Ladakh, you all can count on us to do something like that for sure. Very yes. soon. Um, yeah. uh, Chris, there's so, a question here from Mayur. Uh, okay. He wants to know, isn't uh, that reverse mode gimmicky? If you ask him, he's saying it is useless for such a small and light vehicle um gimmicky to an extent but then see uh, if you're stuck on a if you're stuck in a tight spot if you've parked on an incline uh, if you're facing in the uh, if you're facing a bit uh, downward so to speak and you've got to like reverse out of your parking area and uh, maneuver it and there's not a lot of room for your legs and stuff like that so that would be a helpful uh, feature to have it's not it's not 100 percent gimmicky it is a bit gimmicky to be honest it's not really required but it it has its pros it has some usefulness to it all so um, it's a good thing it's better tech better features to have it's another feature to have on your scooter so it's not a real bad thing after all okay uh here's another question coming in from uh Shazib. he wants to know what are the ranges in eco modes uh what are the basic ranges ola website says only the ranges eco mode okay uh yeah so basically uh these guys have uh, on the spec sheet they have just basically uh, given out their eco mode uh, what do you say the range capabilities because that is the mode that you're going to be looking forward to uh, getting the best out of the battery and the longest time you're going to be riding the scooter so basically i think it's around uh, if i'm not mistaken uh, charging time i think around uh, 120, 120 kilometers for the S1 and around 181 kilometers claimed, I think, for the S1 Pro, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So um, that should be, uh, once again, these are ARAI figures. So out in the real world, uh, you could say that it's going to be around 100 kilometers for the S1 and around like 120 to 130 for the S1 Pro. But once again, we'll really have to test it ourselves to really give you an idea of how truthful that is. And we really haven't gotten a chance to do that as of now. So uh, we'll have to really test the scooter out, get our hands on it once again, give it a nice run through the city, check it out completely, and then get back to you on that. As of now, we can't really confirm. It's just like figures that the company have given us. So uh, we can't really comment on that as of now. Okay. 
okay, I see that Rohit has joined us as well. I'll just add him to this conversation. Hi, Rohit. Hello, Soheni. Hello, Chris. I hope you guys can hear me. My network's uh, not great. Uh, but uh, Chris, uh, I, I believe that you have uh, had a good time with the Ola scooter. Uh, we've heard a lot from that uh, event and I think you guys made it back in good time before the rains and the bad weather hit uh, hit that uh, venue where they were planning to do the Ola uh, rides for the other media as well. Uh, so, uh, Chris, your quick takeaway from uh, the Ola scooter. Uh, uh, now, I have not seen that scooter in the flesh, uh, but I had seen it when it was the Etergo. Uh, I had seen it uh, somewhere in Italy where uh, they were doing a promo shoot for it when it was uh, called the Etergo. Uh, so does it, uh, I mean, at least then I, I still didn't get a, uh, uh, you know, closer uh, feel of the materials or anything. But how does the Ola scooter feel when, uh, you know, you see it in, in the in the flesh? Does it look like an expensive premium scooter? Because the Etago was uh, quite a premium scooter uh, when they announced it. So do you get that kind of a premium feel uh, from the India made Ola as well? Yep, yep. So uh, as far as like build quality and stuff go, it feels good. It, fe it looks the part. Uh, but then, then again, uh, uh, the quality of materials it feels solid. But then again, there are a bit, there are a couple of panel gaps that kind of let it down. Then the rubber foot mat, uh, some on some of the scooters, the test scooters that we had, it wasn't really sitting flush. So it was, it was a bit uh, off-putting, you could say. But all in all, the the quality uh, seems good. There are a couple of issues I that I personally had, like with this uh, with the side stand, it felt a bit flimsy. Even the uh, the real the grab rail at the back they they felt uh, a bit flimsy to be honest they didn't uh, feel really sturdy as sturdy as I'd like it to be but overall it seems like a it seems like a very good job it seems well put together uh, apart from these uh, small tiny aspects but I'm sure the company is gonna figure that out as soon as uh, people get back to them and say okay fine this is what we have get, uh, they get their feedback from customers and people like us so. I think it's a it's a good step as uh, for for now. It feels like a good solid product. Okay, so I have one more question for you, Chris. So uh, you know now you've written the product, you've seen the product, uh, but uh, a lot of people are not going to be able to go to a dealership and touch and feel this product at all. Uh, a lot of people will have to buy it online. Would you still uh, you know recommend the scooter? Would you yourself uh, buy the scooter given the way in which you would have to go about uh, doing that business? Uh, compared to you know any other scooter, any other uh, two wheeler, which you can simply just walk into a showroom, take a test ride, book your scooter. You have that you have that physical address or a brick and mortar right. structure where you can go back for uh, you know any kind of support, any kind of test rides, any kind of look and feel. All of that is not here with the scooter so far. So would you still uh, go ahead and buy the Ola scooter from a buyer's perspective? Uh, from a buyer's perspective, if I was in the market considering an electric scooter at this point in time. Uh, yes, I might. But uh, once again, as you mentioned, uh, there is a bit of an upsetting uh, bit here. That is the fact that you can only test ride the scooter at this point in time if you had already registered to buy it. So uh, it, 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 can, it kind of has um, a first come first serve kind of thing where uh, the, the, those who initially booked the scooter can actually uh, test ride it right now. So um, I will only ride the scooter or consider buying it once I have actually uh, gotten a chance to buy it. So uh, now that I have personally, I think I would wait for the issues to be solved and then ride it again because, uh, yeah, my review of it is rather incomplete as per this point in time because, of course, there were a couple of issues that we came across during our small stint with the scooter in Bangalore earlier on. So I will have to wait for the scooter to be complete as a package really um, experience it all get a good feel of the battery get a good feel of the range um, put it out there and then yes make my decision as of now um, not so much so not really okay um, we'll get back to our questions uh, Kamlesh wants to know that the speakers that have been given in the scooter are they waterproof uh, yes they are waterproof and they are like the rest of the scooter under the three-year warranty so uh there is a particular um uh, bracket i think it's a uh, three years unlimited uh kilometers warranty for uh the non-moving parts and uh, the moving parts have like a couple of uh, kilometers i think forty thousand kilometers or a three-year warranty that they uh, fall under so yes 
Uh, Sandeep wants to know why is there no dealer network for the Ola yet? So uh, the plan that these guys are following is they are trying to keep everything online, like from their service to the dealer network. It's all supposed to be online as of now in the initial phase. So um, um, everything from uh, suppose you wanted to book a scooter, you have to go online. If you wanted to service a scooter, you have to go online. If you want to, in fact, even if you have a small problem, like you wake up in the morning, you start riding your scooter and you find something out of the ordinary, like some squeaky sound or something. Yeah, something out of the ordinary you have to basically go online and register uh your problem with the company before they send the service people to your house to service the scooter now um when i asked the when i asked the guys at ola as to why they've gone about it uh this way basically they were like yeah so even if we had a physical service center a physical showroom that you had to go and check out the scooter or get it serviced at they wouldn't do it on the spot you would have to uh, first book your book your slot, book an appointment, and then the mechanic would get back to you uh, with saying that, okay, fine, this is the reason that you have this problem, and then address it, which would be a time-consuming affair. But then once you have the guy coming to you, it all happens at your doorstep, and it pretty much happens at the same amount of time. So, um, yeah, that is the reason that we've been given. And uh, the dealership network, as in, uh, so, yeah, the Ola is basically trying to keep everything online, keep it as a premium electric experience. So uh, basically, they're trying to keep it as uh, how you would uh, basically manage your phone or something, uh, some electronic appliance. They want to make everything accessible from your home. They don't want you to step out of your way. It's all like e-commerce. It's very e-commerce friendly. And uh, that's the way they're trying to keep it as of now. OK. I'm going to remind everyone at this point that I'm not going to take your questions if you don't uh like the video so go ahead and uh, give us uh, a like for this video every time we ask uh, your questions here's one from shantanu how is the whole charging network pan india coming along because till now there are mostly announcements but nothing substantial yes yeah, so um it is coming along but it's moving at a snail's pace as of now ola also are not very clear on they're not giving out numbers as to how many charging units how many charging stations are currently set up at this point in time uh, we'd have no clear indication of that and uh, but they have mentioned that there are going to be around 100 of them by the time uh, by the end of this week actually so we are yet to figure that out we have to see how many charging network how many charging stations have been set up uh, by the company as of this point in time we have no real uh, idea of how many are currently set up. All right. Uh, here's a question from Naman. Why? Uh, what about the battery replacement costs? Why has no one been talking about them in their reviews? Okay. So uh, the battery replacement costs, once again, um, it falls under the three-year warranty. So uh, yeah, for the next three years, once you buy a scooter, you won't really have to pay for that if you uh, happen to come across, if you happen to have some um, problem with your battery or you need it replaced or some uh, some problem or the other so but i think the actual cost of the battery is a bit steep it should be around a little over 50 to 60 k if i'm not mistaken so but once again it's already covered under your um warranty so that shouldn't be a real issue as of now all right um Chris, there were a couple of questions which had come on our YouTube story as well. And these two, uh, I would like you to answer. One was from Rajiv. He wanted to know, is there any option for ladies' footrest? Ladies' footrest? Oh, uh, no. As of now, no, there isn't. The company haven't. Uh, what you see from the pictures and what you've seen in, in the videos, uh, the scooter comes as is. The company have no... Uh, as of now, they do not have any accessory or optional fitment for the ladies' footrest at the back. So, Okay. And uh, one last question. Bharat Nivas had asked, uh, if the scooter's charge drains out completely and the touchscreen doesn't function, how do you open the boot and the charging point, especially if you're away from home? And I'd like to add to that, is that not a safety concern if it's uh, easily, uh, you know, you can access it easily without any lock? Yep, yep. That's an awesome question. And I asked the Ola guys this myself. So uh, basically, uh, they have said that, no, first of all, no, there is no uh, charge. There is no locking mechanism for uh, the port 
like there is a small flap at the back which is which doesn't lock so technically anyone can open that port and if they wanted to be really nasty they could like mess around with it and uh, really muck up things a bit for you uh, the second thing is uh, yes uh, the scooter does not have uh, the scooter's boot the the underseat storage space is only accessible through the screen but ola said that even though uh, the scooter might not run the battery might be drained enough not to run the scooter the, the battery will always retain some percent of juice to keep the screen functioning so where you whereby you can access your boot and uh, some functioning of the scooter as well also there will be a um, an option on your app which you have registered from a registered phone where you can access the boot from okay all right uh, i guess uh, those are all the questions that we have oh okay there's this just one more so me wants to know is there any date when the ola scooters can be delivered in odisha do you have any idea uh not really no not at this point in time so uh, ola basically have said that deliveries are going to be uh, more prompt uh, the more closer to the metropolises or if you are in a metropolis like bombay or bangalore bangalore for instance if you happen to uh, agree once you've tested in the scooter even if you don't wish to test ride the scooter and you just given them the go ahead and say okay i book my scooter and everything you will probably in all probability get your scooter that same week but then the further away you are from Uh, a tier a tier three city, uh, the chances are there's going to be a slight delay in you getting a, a scooter. So uh, that's what we've been told as of now. All right. Thanks a lot, Chris, for joining us uh, today and answering all the questions. We'll just uh, run right. through the show with the news and uh, the other story as well. There's a story about the Celerio as well, so we'll uh, get to that. Thanks, Chris. All right. Cheers. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Uh, in fact, um, Rohit, I'll quickly uh, run through the news. So I will start with the one which uh, the Mercedes launched, the hot hatch launch. In fact, I see Simran has joined us as well. So I'm going to get to uh, you know get Simran's view on this as well because uh, he's just recently driven it. But I'll just uh, run through the news first. So Mercedes. Has just launched the AMG A forty five S four Matic at seventy nine point five lakh rupees ex showroom India. That's the price before options. It is powered by a specially developed M one thirty nine two liter turbo petrol that makes four twenty one PS and five hundred newton meters. It's paired to an eight speed AMG dual clutch automatic with launch control and an AMG tuned all wheel drive system. There are six driving modes being offered: slippery, eco. Comfort, Sport, Sport Plus, and Race. Mercedes India tells us this is the fastest hatchback on sale in India. Speaking of which, it reaches 100 kmph in just 3.9 seconds, with a top speed restricted to 270 kmph. So uh, we will be getting you a review of this story pretty soon. But uh, Simran got to have a lot of fun at uh, Natrax uh, recently. So let's just hear a bit more from uh, Simran. Hi Simran. Hi, hi guys. Hi. Hello Simran. Hi. Okay. So the A forty five S. What what a thing! What a thing! Um, I think one of the most fun AMGs I've ever driven. If anyone remembers or has seen reviews of what the CLA forty five and the GLA forty uh, five felt like, those were the hand built two liter uh, uh, four cylinder engines that were available. I think up to uh, three years back, and now you've got uh, the non-hand built two-liter uh, turbocharged four-cylinder that's available in the GLA 35 and the A35. So using all of that as reference, this thing still stands out because it's the first time that a, a S model has been available um, in India on that same engine, on the two-liter hand-built AMG engine, and. It's it's nuts. Unfortunately, our drive experience was very limited uh, at the Natrax, so we jumped in the car, and a minute later, we literally were doing two seventy eight kmph, which is the the non adjusted top speed that we saw at the Natrax. All right, that that seems uh, very unfortunate, given that you were at Natrax and you can touch three hundred kmph, right? <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a quandary. I mean, on the one hand, we got to drive it very quickly, but on the other hand, we be the top speed is pretty much all that we got to do. We got to experience some of the g-forces of the acceleration, uh, and like I said, it's it's fast. It's very very fast. Um, to give you some context, the uh, Audi RS5, which has uh, about the same power, if not a little more, but is heavier, accelerates zero hundred in the same time, three point nine seconds, uh, which we've tested it. Unfortunately, we couldn't test the A45s. But a claim 3.9 for a hatchback, and keep in mind that this is about 1.6 tons, and it's about the size uh, between. I'm going to use a strange reference here, but between the Creta and the Alcazar. So it's not a small car; it's a fairly large car. It's got a large wheelbase. In fact, the wheelbase is slightly longer than the Alcazar. So it's a large car. So if you're thinking small hatchback for whatever they end up pricing it at. Uh, sorry, for what they've priced it at, uh, you'd be wrong. It's a large car and it's got a decent amount of space inside. But I don't think space is the right uh, metric to to compare the A45s to anything on because it's got a feel that so far uh, no other AMG, even the big uh, bi-turbo V8, um, just can't quite match just because. It's lighter than all of them. It's smaller than all of them, and it's got that engine that's uh, that's got the power, got the torque, and got a quick gearbox to go with it. So it's got everything going for it. it but I think uh, the problem with the A45s could be that people would still view it as oh, it's a hatchback for for the price that it's at. So I think that the could Mercedes be the AMG only logo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That could be the uh, only yeah. potential stumbling block, but yeah. There is a question. Uh, Bhargava wants to know, is the A45 AMG faster than the M340i? How could Mercedes-Benz push out so much power just from a 2-liter petrol engine? It is quicker. So um, it's uh, it's all about the just the, the, the tuning of the engine and the, the components and how far the, the manufacturer is willing to push each of those components, uh, this engine does feel like they might be more in it still. Um, as to how they've managed to do that, I really don't know. Uh, the AMG guys say it's just part of the secret sauce. Uh, but yeah, it's it's like we said, it's the most power dense engine in the world. It's uh, at least mass produced. There was an engine that was in the Mitsubishi Lancer, which had a little bit more power for, from the same two liter four cylinder format. But currently in today's world with our current emissions regulations, this is very, very, very impressive. Okay. Um, okay, I'll quickly run through the news and uh, we'll get back uh, to another review and Simran will get back to more questions. Um, yeah, so the next bit of news is from another German manufacturer. This time it's BMW. Uh, they have also, uh, they have just unveiled uh, the Black Shadow limited edition of the 220i model, which is being locally produced at its uh, Chennai plant. The Black Shadow 2 series Grand Coupe prices start from 43.50 lakh rupees ex showroom. The Coupe sports a M front grille with a high gloss black mesh design, black wing mirrors, a sporty high gloss rear spoiler, and black chrome exhaust tips. 18 inch M performance, Y spoke styling, 554 M forged wheels in jet black matte are fitted to the automobile with a BMW logo seen on the floating hubcap. Mechanicals and interior remain unchanged, uh, it remains as the same as the standard variant available. Uh, moving on, Rohit, uh, if you could take us through the motorcycle news, please. Sure. So uh, what do we begin with? Uh, do we have the Aprilia footage to begin with? Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, let's uh, go with the Aprilia. So actually, the SR uh, no, series. No, no. Rohit, sorry. Sorry. If you can yeah. just, uh, we'll get back to the Aprilia. If you can just start with probably the Yamaha or the Suzuki first. Sure. 
sure so okay so let's let's start with uh, the suzuki because that's the all new uh, vehicle really uh, so suzuki yesterday launched the uh, avenis uh, that's what they are calling it so the name essentially comes from the word avenue it's an avenue for you to go and have fun uh, avenue for the young generation to go and have fun that is why it's called the avenis is what they say uh now i won't blame you if you think the scooter is a bit too much uh, like uh, you know the uh, the race er from yamaha or the tvs n talk in terms of the design because yes it does it does look a lot like those because it hasn't closely benchmarked against uh, those two scooters and it takes on those two scooters uh, it gets a 125 cc engine the same engine that you get in the tva uh, in the uh, suzuki access 125 Uh, so essentially you're looking at about 8.7 ps of power and 10 newton meters of torque uh, but it's feature loaded as well uh, you get a usb port uh, you get a multi function uh, display on it it pairs with your android or ios uh, phone uh, through the suzuki Ra- right connect app and then you can also have uh, you know ra- uh, turn by turn navigation on it if you uh, if you uh, like and uh, you also get alerts for your sms's your phone calls including caller id and you also get alerts for uh, whatsapp uh, so you get all those notifications on the screen if you would like something like that so this is a big talking point of course uh, because it is uh, essentially targeted at the young generation the college going crowd and probably they are going to be appreciating uh, this particular uh, feature quite a bit uh, there is a fair bit of under spe- under uh, seat storage as well uh they didn't reveal the numbers yesterday but i believe the brochures are already out uh, on their website so you can check it out uh, it will still not take a full face helmet from what uh, i can see it's going to be a half face helmet uh but yeah there is a, a, a fairly decent uh, under seat storage you get a single uh, big banana seat kind of a layout uh the uh, the foot pegs and the seat uh, has been uh has been designed in such a way that it is more unisex and that's something that we'll find out when we get the vehicle for a review uh hopefully that should be sometime next month the next bit of news again another scooter and that's from aprilia so aprilia's line of the sr scooters have been given a a refresh a mild refresh uh, but you know it works really well because uh, the overall stance of the motorcycle looks a lot sharper now uh, it's not a complete redesign of uh, sorts but it really looks nice and sharp those graphics really work well uh, you have led he- uh, headlamps now they work quite well as well and i think it's uh, overall a, a very clean and a nice looking design uh, so what you see uh, up on top is very similar to what we just saw on the suzuki avenis as well uh, with the integrated turn blinkers but uh, the aprilia sr also gets uh, this uh, digital display now and a few uh, little tweaks here and there in terms of the cosmetics uh, no changes to the mechanicals at all it still is the same engine uh, uh, options that you had previously it's just the graphics and just the design uh, that makes a difference and similarly another vehicle uh, that has made the news is now the yamaha r15 uh, as you are aware the version 4 of the r15 recently came out and uh, we've uh, typically seen this from yamaha where uh, they relaunched the older product the outgoing the previous generation product uh, with uh, the s suffix to it and that's what they've done to the r15 v3 it has now made a comeback as the r15 s and it essentially uh, instead of a split seat it gets that single piece uh, seat unit uh, that you see on the screen right now and it's only available in this blue color uh, so if uh, if you for some reason prefer the uh, uh, the look of the R15 V3 over the V4 or or for some reason if you want a single seat now and if you've already always been waiting for it here you go the R15 S is now here so that's all the motorcycle news uh, that we have uh, for now and uh, back to you producer all right um so we will okay there's just one question before we uh, go into our next review uh, siddesh wants to know any thoughts on the upcoming benelli trk 800 uh well honestly siddesh uh, the trk it's it's a promising product i think where it's let down is uh, the weight the weight of the 502 is what uh, essentially uh, you know uh, made us shy away from that uh, motorcycle otherwise it would have been a perfect entry level adventure uh, bike i will not say entry level but entry level big adventure bike that's what i essentially want to say if you are upgrading from something like the x pulse or a himalayan and you don't want to stretch all the way to a versus or a v strom i think that 502 uh, certainly had a lot going for it but uh, with that weight uh, you know it's it's a bit of a worry it just becomes too heavy now the rumors of the 800 uh, you know uh, the trk 800 are out 
Uh, so we're hoping that, uh, you know, that, that weight will not be a big worry, at least with this bike, because it will have the engine to match. 800 is something that I'm definitely looking forward to. Uh, the, the TRK clearly has a very good styling as well. Uh, the equipment is quite nice. It has a nice stance to it. Uh, so it has a lot going for it, uh, you know, if you really think about it, uh, to take on the likes of the Versus and the V-Strom. Uh, all depends on where Benelli price it. All depends on what kind of a spec we are looking at. Uh, what are, are they planning for the Indian market? So once that happens, we'll have a much better idea. So something to really, really look forward to. All right. And uh, Shantanu wants to know, would Ducati come with a 600cc sports bike? I'm sorry. There's some disturbance here. There are a lot of dogs barking. I hope uh, my audio is clear. Uh, yes, would yes. Ducati come with a 600cc sport bike? Uh, no, I don't think they are going to be doing that. Uh, in fact, if you remember, uh, we had spoken to uh, the Ducati India top boss and uh, we had asked him about you know similar plans, maybe some entry-level motorcycles from Ducati or something in this zone. And uh, there is no concrete answer on that. Uh, they, are, they are pretty well poised with their 950cc uh, engine uh, or the 9, uh, uh, you know, the, the V-twin, the Pani Gali uh, V2 that we've seen and it's it's really working well for them so I'm not sure if they want to go any lower than that yes there is certainly a market for it uh, and there is a range of products that they can build on top of that especially looking at uh, where the monster has been priced at the moment or where the upcoming Street Fighter V2 will be priced there's certainly a space that they can enter if they are able to uh, you know target the 600 cc motorcycles uh, but if you see the world over uh, these 600 cc's, these middleweight uh, motorcycles are uh, not that popular anymore. Uh, blame it on the electronics, which let you uh, dull down the power from a more a more powerful engine. They, it let you uh, they, uh, these electronics let you dull dull down the power as well. So uh, you know the whole idea of people going for a smaller capacity uh, motorcycle has now reduced. Of course, there is insurance, and then there is the licensing in different parts of the world. Uh, but overall, if you look at it, the 600 segment uh, is uh, seeing a lot of slowdown. So I'm not sure if Ducati would want to enter that. But yes, there is some some space there. And, you know, you never know. I mean, they might do something, but nothing that we know of so far. Actually, Rohit, in his uh, follow-up chats, he's uh, basically saying he wants to buy a bike and he was considering the V2, but it seems too powerful. So any suggestions on what he should go for? Shanduru, like I just said, uh, you know, just the way the liter class machines have riding modes to dull down the power, it's the same with, uh, with the V2. You have different, uh, you know, riding modes on that. So you can always dull down the power if you think that it's too powerful. And uh, that should help you uh, learn the motorcycle a lot better, learn the throttle control a lot better. Uh, but of course, if this is going to be the first big bike that you're looking at, maybe you could start uh, start with something smaller. Uh, you know, if you uh, if you will, maybe something like the, uh, the KTM 390 series, you could start with something like that get used to the power and then go step by step. That is that is what I would ideally recommend to everyone that you go step by step so that you can enjoy the power a lot more instead of getting overwhelmed by it every now and then. I'm going to bring uh, Simran in once more. Simran, here's a question from Sunil Prasad. Uh, why have Mercedes bought uh, the A45 to India? They have completely uh, overdone the original formula and suddenly overpriced also, an enthousi any enthusiast knows that a M2 is uh, is better. So why have Mercedes launched it? Because of the the headline fact, obviously, it's India's hottest hatch. And until the RS3 came along, it was the world's quickest accelerating hatchback, um, most powerful four cylinder. Uh, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of nice uh, headline figures associated with the car that make it a very nice halo for that engine and especially at the lower end of the amg price range and i say that with uh, with no sarcasm uh, it it does make sense um yes it is what about um 20 odd lakhs 21 odd lakhs more expensive than the a35 or gla35 um but when you consider the performance that you're getting, so for most of us, those um, the, the the two seconds quicker acceleration and the probably more sustained top speed and stuff like that might not matter. But for the for somebody looking at um, a performance car, uh, it's quarter mile performance, it's zero hundred performance. The fact that you can uh, disengage uh, or rather 
send 80% of the talk to the rear wheels, all of that makes for a very enticing buy. The M2 competition I hear is um, difficult to get your hands on. Uh, it's also a great car, rear wheel drive, so offers up a different kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, it's just part of the whole headline experience that you get with the A45S. Okay. Uh, we Sorry, we'll get back to all the questions in a in a short while once again. But we've got another story for you this week. As you know, Maruti Suzuki has launched the all new Celerio. It comes with a new engine, new transmissions, new chassis, lots of features. All of it at a very good pricing. So Bert tells us whether it's truly worth the asking price. In fact, uh, remember to again send us your questions in the comment section. And Simran has driven it as well, so he's going to be taking all your questions. Uh, just a second. I'm just looking for the video. <laughs> okay. I seem to have uh, a slight problem. So I will first, we'll just get back to our uh, questions uh, and then get back to this once more. Uh, in fact, we can answer this question, uh, Simran. Uh, does the AMT gearbox on the Celerio feel better than the one in the Centro? Um, the short answer is yes. The slightly longer answer is that um, when we test these cars, they usually have uh, very low mileage figures on the clock. Um, they come in pretty much fresh from the factory. So... When we first tested the Santro, the AMT gearbox felt like an evolution of what uh, we the AMTs that we had tried before. Again, it was a, a brand new car, um, around 1,000 kilometers on the clock. It felt very nice. Uh, as the mileage got piled on and with the different sorts of driving styles that we had, we had one as a, a long-term on overdrive. Uh, the performance of the AMT started to slip, uh, literally. So you could feel and hear a, a little bit of the slip at low revs. Similarly, with the Celerio AMT, Maruti says they have retuned it. So it's the same five-speed AMT that's also available on the wagon R. In fact, uh, the powertrain, uh, the engine is all new, but the five-speed gearbox, the manual, and the AMT are shared with the wagon R uh, with a little bit of tuning. So it feels very good there's no jerks at low speed um it handled uh inclines very well maruti have of course added a hill hold assist a hill start assist technology to it which is the first time that's been offered in the segment and we did try it out we did test it out and it works very well uh take your foot off the brake uh, on an incline you've got a good four or five seconds of holding time before the car starts to roll back very slowly. So that gives you more than enough time. Even in an inexperienced driver just driving with their right foot can take their foot off the brake and get back on the throttle and get away clean without the fear of rolling back. It even starts, uh, it even works for um, reverse to an extent. So all of that feels very good. We did notice um, uh, the a little bit of the smell of the clutch coming in on these very steep inclines, which is to be expected. Again, the Celerio uh, that we drove was a brand new car. I think it had um, seven, 800 kilometers on the clock when we drove it. So there's no telling how, um, how it'll perform uh, maybe a few months down the line or with a couple more thousand kilometers on the clock. In our experience, uh, AMTs also have a very specific a uh, driving pattern requirement. Uh, they just seem to age more gracefully uh, the, the kinder you treat them. Because at the end of the day, even with a manual car, if you're going to be rough with your manual car and you're constantly riding the clutch, you will end up burning it out. I'm so sorry, I was on mute. Um, so basically, I was just saying that we'll quickly run through the story and we'll get back to answering all the questions on the scenario. 
It's been almost two years since Maruti has had a new product out in the market. In fact, a little over two years for that matter. But now, we're finally here in Udaipur to drive this. This is the all-new Celerio. It comes on a completely new platform, the Hardtech 5 platform, and it's got a new engine, the K10C. So, significant changes, a whole new perspective. Let's see what the all-new Celerio is about. The dimensions of the new Celerio have increased considerably compared to the older generation car. The wheelbase has grown as well, not just the length and the width, the wheelbase is longer and so is the track, both front and rear. However, the height of the car has dropped down by about 5mm. I'm not too fond of the way the Celerio looks, it reminds me a bit of the A-Star, those slightly bulbous, enlarged surfaces. The intent, of course, is to give it a more muscular look. But somewhere down the line, I do believe Maruti Suzuki needs some better design coming into their cars. The interiors are fairly spartan. The plastics, well, they do feel plasticky, but they've got some nice textures and the material quality isn't too bad considering this price retails at well under about 18 and a half lakh rupees on road. Even the top end, and I'm referring to the top end. The plastic quality isn't too bad at all. The steering is nice and grippy. It's got all the right set of buttons right there for you to access. It doesn't have a climate control system. You still get a slightly old schooled setup. You don't get AC vents at the rear, but you've got this nice touch screen and that has got uh, the latest interface that you've seen on the last few generations of Maruti's cars. It works well. What it does not offer is connected technology. It doesn't offer wireless charging. But there are several other features for comfort and convenience that Maruti has added into the Celerio. One glaring design faux pas are the keyless entry switches on the door panels. If you look at them closely, you'll notice there is a button that sits by itself right there on the door away from the door handle and I just couldn't figure out why wasn't that integrated either into the door handles or in a slightly smarter way as you can see I've got Simran and Ani sitting on either side of me and uh, we're not exactly the average Indian body shape but there's still reasonably enough shoulder room of course, my shoulders are overlapping both Simran and Anis. Uh, but still, this feels like a fairly comfortable, uh, wide enough rear seat to be sitting in. Ideally, you'd just want to have two people inside over here. But if you had to fit in a third, someone as large as me, you've got the space. What's most impressive though, is the amount of knee room. Now, this knee room has grown, or rather the cabin space has grown by almost 90 mm compared to the older car. So, you've got a fair amount of knee room. Headroom also, there is certainly a lot more headroom than what you've seen in more premium, far more expensive cars for that matter. So, all in all, this is a very spacious cabin to be inside. This new Celerio has got an all-new platform. It's the fifth generation of the Hardtech platform. And essentially, apart from being dimensionally larger, there's extensive use of high-strength steels which has also enabled the weight of the Celerio to come down by almost about 10 kgs across the board. One of the key changes in the new Celerio is of course that K10C engine, which is the next generation of the famed K10 engine. And there are several new technologies applied to this engine with the principal aim being to improve fuel efficiency. Now, it's got uh, a dual VVT, it's got uh, an integrated exhaust manifold, it's got uh, dual injectors and a cool DGR. Now, these are the four areas we're principally worked on. This essentially improves its flexibility, its uh, range of operations and thereby you get better efficiency. Maruti claims it does 26.68 kilometers per liter, which is a tremendous amount for a car in this segment. Uh, 
Now this one liter petrol engine makes about 67 PS of max power and you got about 89 newton meters of max torque. It is peppy, it is zingy, but it is ideal for urban conditions or even to drive it around on highways, roads that are, well, flat. As you get towards some inclines, you feel the engine stressing itself and you need to shift down to lower gears. Second, and sometimes even first, to make that climb up, depending on the intensity of that gradient. But for all other purposes, urban areas especially, it's a comfortable engine. There is enough power on tap to give it reasonably good drivability. The five-speed manual transmission that's in the new Celerio has been borrowed from the Wagoner, but it's an effortless and smooth shifting transmission. On the AMT, you will have a bit of a struggle climbing uphill, especially tight uphill section. Nonetheless, I've also driven the Celerio with the AMT transmission in urban areas inside Udaipur town, and it felt comfortable over there. There are no issues whatsoever. Ride quality has improved as well in the new Celerio. The suspension dampers and the springs have been worked on extensively and with that being re-engineered, what you've got is a more supple ride quality on some broken patches across some minor speed breakers. What we've noticed is that there is a lot of bounce. You do feel the car bouncing around. Also, there's very little travel on the suspension so it's quite possible on certain bad sections or if you go too fast across a speed breaker, you will feel the suspension crashing into its uh, bump stops. One important change and one that works favorably where safety is concerned, where stability is concerned, is the steering. It's more precise but more importantly, there is a lot more weight to it. From what I remember, the old scenario, it felt a lot lighter and at highway speeds, that was a bit unsafe. But now, this new steering system has been tweaked as well and uh, there is a fair amount of weight that comes into it. Weight that you can feel at low speeds or even at highway speeds. The scenario has got uh, discs up ahead and drums on the rear wheels and uh, this functions pretty well. You've also got ABS. So you've got a fairly large safety net in case of an emergency. However, I would recommend that you don't push this car too hard around corners. Enjoy it for what it is, an urban mover or something to commute from point to point. That is where the Celerio excels at. So how does the Maruti Celerio shape up? I think it's a fairly competent hatchback. I'm not too fond of the way it looks, but that's a personal preference. However, I do like the interiors. The car's grown larger, and because of that, you've got a lot more space. The materials inside feel contemporary, modern, well-built. And of course, then there's all of that uh, new stuff that Maruti has injected into the car. It's got uh, new features, it's got comfort, convenience, and of course, there's safety as well. All of that to give the Celerio a more upmarket, a more premium stance. In addition, Maruti also claims the new K10C engine. Its fuel efficiency, which is about 26.64 kilometers per liter, is what the nation needs at this hour. So yes, this is a fairly attractive package, especially considering that it exists in that price bracket between 5 lakh to 7 lakh rupees. All in all, I do believe Maruti has another winner on its hands. All right, uh, Simran, Naman says this still looks like an upgrade to an auto. Do you agree? <laughs> yeah, I I think it it definitely does have uh, uh, the genes of the Alto in it. In fact, um, it seems like it's a cross between the Alto 800 and, like Bert said, the A Star and a little bit of uh, the regular Alto K10. It um, I think a lot of people see a lot of different cars in it. Someone uh, said they see the Swift in it, someone said they see a little bit of the Ignis in it, someone says they see a little bit of the Espresso in it. Um, I am not a big fan of how it looks and I usually like uh, 
some of Bharati's uh, quirkier designs. I'm a very big fan of the Ignis, and despite popular opinion, I very much like the Espresso. I think all the Espresso needed were a nice set of wheels, um, which is actually the, the, the best part on the Celeri. I really like the wheels on it. I think the wheels have been lifted from the second gen Swift, um, and they've been painted in a very nice shade of gunmetal gray. Um, and for a change, I think the, the, the wheel arch to tire gap is just about right for a car of its size. It doesn't seem like it's sitting too high up like the Espresso did. But yeah, I'm not a very big fan of the looks. It doesn't feel entirely cohesive to me. Uh, like Bert pointed out, the, the unlock request buttons are kind of tacked on on the side, which is obviously a cost-saving measure. But the good thing is that they're there because they're on the, the driver side door, they're on the passenger side door, and they're on the boot lid. So. Uh, Nitin Joshua is saying extreme cost cutting in the scenario should rear passengers operate power windows with their foot. <laughs> uh, you, you could look at it as a pro or a con, can't you? Um, it does take some getting used to. You do fumble around a little bit. Uh, but obviously, anyone who buys the car is going to get used to it within a matter of minutes. Mm. It does also mean that there's a lot more uh, elbow room and just generally the feeling of space in the cabin feels like it's a lot more just by the very simple fact of making your door cards itself slimmer by not housing the, the electronics for the power window switches. So, so I'm confused. How do you operate it then? There are switches, are switches on the center console where you would expect oh. your rear of AC vents to be. You have two toggle switches there. Uh, similarly, up front, the, the power window switches are on the center console. It's like how the Nano Just used to be. Uh, no, it's actually further up. So it's uh, slightly easier to reach because it's just below the infotainment screen. OK. Uh, there are questions, in fact, about the safety as well, because we've not really focused on that. Do you uh, have anything to say about that in regards to safety? Shantanu says he thinks that the buyers will be a big loser. Uh, okay, so what I can tell you is what Maruti has told us, and up till um, we actually have G and cap ratings for these cars, it's it's it. We just have this information to go on, uh, but uh, I can't say that the high strength steel usage in this car has gone up versus the old Celerio. It's actually more than double. So the old Celerio used about seventeen percent of HSS. And this has gone up to 40%, which uh, has a, a two-prong effect. One, it makes the uh, the body in white as well as the structure lighter. It also makes it stronger. So interestingly, the, the new Celerio is actually lighter than the old car. And I know a lot of people equate weight to safety. Uh, and that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of science that goes into designing a safe crash structure as is. Um, but once again, the, the the proof will only come out of a, a crash test as well. OK. Rohit, uh, Electron Vlogs uh, was getting very impatient. He's been asking about the Pulsar 220. Uh, has it been discontinued? Is it true? And can the new 250 series, uh, will it be able to make uh, the kind of wave the P220 made, the Pulsar 220 made? Right. Electron logs, uh, first and foremost, please don't spam the uh, the chat box. Uh, we hear your questions, we read your questions, and we take your questions as well. And we do that quite regularly because I remember this username. Uh, so please don't spam uh, the, uh, the comments box. Uh, similarly, Bajaj doesn't want to uh, spam their uh, dealerships with too many pulsers, uh, which is why the 220 is going out. Uh, because if you think about it, the 220 doesn't really uh, share its engine or uh, its body work with any of the other pulsers. Uh, so the economies of scale uh, are just not going to be justified there. Uh, now with the 250 is uh, sitting very close in that uh, similar price uh, bracket and with a higher performance. Uh, so is the 250s that they will concentrate on. Uh, will they make the kind of wave that the P220 made? Uh, probably not, uh, because if you've seen my review, uh, that's exactly what I said in the opening statement itself, where uh, in today's times, probably the 250 uh, badge doesn't make 
that much of uh, a difference to uh, youngsters because there are a lot more uh, powerful motorcycles that are available and you know uh, the banks are only making it easier for everyone to buy these vehicles uh, thanks to uh, tailor made emi schemes so uh, yes it will probably not create the kind of waves that the 220 did when uh, it came out it also brought in a lot of new technology back then uh, in comparison the 250 doesn't do uh, do that as much but is it a bad product is it a dud product not at all far from it in fact uh, i think both the 250s are excellent uh, they are uh, you know pretty down to basics uh, as i would like to call it and uh, because of that they are a lot of fun to ride uh, and if you are looking for riding fun purely from your motorcycle and not really concerned about bluetooth connectivity and whatsapp alerts and uh, missed call alerts on on that screen uh you know it, this is essentially what motorcycling fun, uh, fun is all about it handles pretty well uh it's a very sharp uh, cornering machine the engine uh, uh, performs quite well for a single cylinder 250 uh so yeah i think uh, it is uh, a, a very well rounded product and it has come at a brilliant price tag because it's not too far away from the p220 which is why the 220 is going out also this engine uh this bodywork uh, we will see in smaller variants uh Uh, soon uh, going forward uh, is what Bajaj tells us. Uh, in fact, uh, the two hundred and twenty was one of the first bikes to go out. Some of the other pulsars are also intended to be phased out and replaced with smaller variants. And when I say small, I'm talking about engine capacity. Smaller variants of the new two hundred and fifties that we've seen. So that will happen in the coming decade. Exactly when I don't know, but uh, it is something that we should all expect. Is what Bajaj tells us. And uh, Dilip Kumar wants to know what's your opinion on the X Pulse four uh, V over the two V? Are there any noticeable differences in engine and overall pull? Honestly, uh, Dilip, I am also waiting to find out. We've still not got our uh, hands on the motorcycle. Uh, Hero still not sent them through to us. Uh, however, we uh, we did speak to a few people who have test ridden these motorcycles for Hero, uh, and they say that the engine is noticeably smoother. Uh, now, if you remember uh, from the BS4 to the BS6 itself, uh, within the two-valve engine, uh, we saw a noticeable difference in the refinement and also in the power delivery. The BS6 engine actually felt uh, a lot peppier than the BS4, uh, which was uh, a very unusual case because we've seen a lot of these single-cylinder BS4s to BS6 uh, transitions where the BS6 uh, versions have just not felt as good or as peppy. Uh, here, it feels even better. Now, with the four-valve, I'm expecting it to be. Uh, slightly better. They have reworked the the torque curve a little bit, is what I'm told. Uh, they also have a different uh, power rating now. So I'm hoping that this is going to make the riding experience a little bit nicer. Now the X Pulse has always been a very uh, nice, uh, you know, learning tool if you are uh, planning to go off road, do the trails, maybe even. You know, train yourself for a little bit of MX stuff before you actually go on to the MX motorcycles. So the X Pulse is a well-rounded product in that sense, and I think the four wall is only going to make it a little bit better. But how much better uh, in terms of numbers, in terms of actual feel, is something that I can tell you only after we ride the motorcycle. So we are eagerly waiting for Hero to send us that motorcycle. All right, uh, Sleek Minister, I am not a motorcycle expert. I am just here to. Uh, ask the questions that you guys are asking to our experts. So, if you have any questions uh, apart from just a statement, do use the comment section and let us know. Uh, Simran, Sunil wants to know: Is Maruti planning to bring the new S Cross, considering the car has never been a strong seller? And what? Uh, and with the new SUV from Toyota and Maruti coming soon, uh, will it also compete in the same segment? Uh, yeah. Uh... In fact, this is going to be the I think the global debut of the new S Cross is slated for the end of this month. Twenty fifth November is the date that I've been um, seeing in reports, and it will come to India uh, sometime next year, hopefully. The S Cross I think filled uh, a requirement for a lot of people who are looking for for an SUV that was larger than the Brezza, but. Also smaller than the legs of the Creta, so at that point it it did work well. I know a lot of families who are very happy with the S Cross and the space that it offers because it is quite a large car on the inside. Okay, um, Rohit Siddesh wants to know: Is KTM uh, bringing the seven ninety or eight ninety ADV anytime soon to India? Uh, Sidesh, it's it's a new rumor every month, uh, and everyone we he- we keep hearing the same things that. uh it's either delayed it's cancelled or it's coming so it's it's gone into that cycle of rumors uh, and every one there is something uh, you know new uh, that's coming in from here so i i really can't say uh, like i told you last time uh, the 790 duke hasn't uh, been received quite well in the indian market that's down to the pricing and uh, that lukewarm response has sort of uh, 
you know told ktm to not really look into uh, big bikes for the indian market but uh, i don't know maybe let's hope that the 890 or the 790 adv uh, comes to india because uh, there have been reports that the bikes have been testing in the indian market for uh, some time now so let's just hope that they put the 790 uh, duke debacle behind them and they actually uh, bring in the adv because at that price point an adv could definitely make more sense uh, than the street naked uh simran bright hammer wants to know is a q2 a good option he wants a punchy engine yes no whole hearted yes it's it's a very good car to drive it's a great car to drive if you can find it on discount because i think the 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 exorbitant prices that they had for it were just too high um we did do a comparison test of the audi q2 the volvo xc40 and the bmw x1 and i think in terms of value the the x1 can be had uh, with some great deals with and it's it's one of the roomiest cars out of the the bunch uh, the xc40 uh, it was the winner of that particular test but the q2 just maxed the scores when it came to the engine gearbox the refinement and the overall dynamics it's a great car to drive uh to be driven around in not so much it feels small uh the ride could be a little stiff if you're looking for something that's more comfort oriented but yeah punchy engine definitely q2 okay uh, nitin wants to know when can he expect to walk around review of the skoda slavia monday monday 11 am is when our walk around review will go live and uh, rohit mayur wants to know the rc200 or the pulsar 250 overall opinion are uh, two different kinds of bikes uh, my uh, the rc200 you are looking at a super sport so uh, you know the super sport comes with its own pros and cons the cons being the full body work uh, you know on our conditions uh, you can end up uh, you know with a body work that's rattling all the time because of the amount of bad roads that we have uh, at the same time uh, when you hit the race track the rc200 is definitely going to be a lot sharper than uh, either of the pulsar 250 so depends on what you really want Now I'm a super sport guy myself, so if I had to uh, probably pick up a motorcycle out of the two, and if I was in college right now, uh, probably I would go with the RC 200. I like the way it looks, uh, despite everything that has been said about the new design. And having owned an RC 390, I know how sharp the RC series of motorcycles from KTM is. Uh, so my choice would definitely be the RC 200. But if you're looking for a street bike right now, uh, you know, uh, maybe compared to uh, uh, most of the other 250s that are in the market. not including the KTM uh, 250 of course the 250 duke is in a different league uh, altogether but if i were to compare the domina 250 or the uh, suzuki jixa 250 the fz uh, 25 i would i think still uh, pick up the pulsar save a lot of money invest that money in riding gear and enjoy my motorcycling because uh, the pulsar 250 is just feel very pure and very basic in a nice way uh okay and here's one from dilip kumar Are you eagerly waiting for a YSD or Classic Java? Any new models which are uh, which might uh, set fire to the Royal Enfield models? If they But we already know time? that uh, we already know that the Java Adventure motorcycle is coming. Uh, the spy shots have been all around. In fact, uh, you can head over to Old Drive Routine. We have a spy video of uh, the Java Adventure motorcycle as well. Uh, and uh, we also know that there is going to be a scrambler variant uh, out of that same platform and uh, both these motorcycles use the same engine from the java perak uh, so yeah sorry not java uh, yes the adventure motorcycle and yes the scrambler is coming with the java engine uh, it's going to run a different chassis different suspension setup uh, and those will go up against uh, essentially the royal enfield himalayan uh, so himalayan also has a himalayan street uh, variant coming out So essentially, these two YSDs will go up against those two motorcycles, the current Himalayan and the Himalayan Street. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, we also hear that uh, Java is working on a cruiser uh, with the Perak engine, uh, and uh, uh, I don't know exactly where they are going to be placing it because all the spy shots that we've seen for the cruiser, uh, they don't really look like a typical cruiser. They are still more uh, in line with the modern retro, something like the Royal Enfield Classic 350 or Java's own Java. So. uh you know i don't know where that motorcycle is going to be placed or uh, what that uh, final form factor is going to be like but they are also working on a new java so maybe that could also catch your fancy okay one last question will mahindra offer the scorpio with all the features that were offered in the xuv 700 and will we be getting new twin peaks logo uh, on the scorpio 2 
Yes, the twins, uh, the Twin Peaks logo will certainly uh, make its way onto all of Mahindra's SUVs. That includes the Scorpio, that includes the five door Thar, that includes any uh, new SUVs that will come out uh, from Mahindra. Then that's uh, essentially what they are trying to tell you that uh, this this logo goes on vehicles that are made for all kinds of terrain. So anything that wears an SUV badge from Mahindra will definitely have this logo. Uh, as far as the features go, well, no, it will not come with all the features that have uh, come on the XUV 700. I doubt if the ADAS uh, is going to uh, come on the Scorpio. And even if it does, I doubt if uh, it will be as advanced as what you uh, see on the XUV 700. It's certainly not coming with two screens uh, like you see, uh, see on the XUV 700. So, yeah, not all the features are going to be uh, common between the two cars because uh, at the end of the day, the XUV 700 is the flagship for the brand. Whereas the Scorpio is the more utilitarian vehicle. It's something that slots between uh, the likes of the Bolero and, uh, you know, their more uh, crossover vehicles like the XUV uh, uh, 500 for that matter, which is now uh, likely to be phased out. So uh, maybe what you could expect is features that are better than the outgoing XUV 500, but certainly not uh, the same feature list that you see on the XUV 700. Some of it will certainly filter down, but not all of it. All right, guys, thanks so much for your questions. We are kind of running out of time and uh, we will definitely catch up with you next week. Uh, but before that, uh, let me just remind you that you can tune into the Overdrive uh, TV show tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, we will be getting you a review of the Celerio in case you miss that and the Ola S1 Pro electric scooter. And we will also bring you a review of the Mercedes AMG GLA 35. You really don't want to miss that. So do tune in uh, tomorrow. You can also catch the show on Sad uh, on Sunday at 12.30 or 8 p.m. Have a great weekend and thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks, Rohit. Thanks, Simran. Thank right. you so many. Good, good night, weekend. everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.